Metro Police say these drills are meant to be as realistic as possible, so we want to warn you, this video might be sensitive to some people. The building next to UMC, the hospital's director of public safety says they do this every couple of years. UMC employees volunteer to participate either as bystanders or victims, but it was also a good chance for them to learn what to do if they ever find themselves in this situation. What are our officers going to do with Metro? How are we going to communicate? How are we going to clear uh, where the shooter is? UMC is a huge hospital. With that being said, if someone just called up and said we have an active shooter at UMC, we have over seven entrances. Which one would they go to? So one of the major things that we're, we are testing today is our communication with law enforcement. And now this type of drill takes nearly a year to set up. That's because employees have to go through other types of training first and UMC had to coordinate with Metro. Metro Police says this is a good way for their officers to stay sharp and get familiar with different building layouts across the valley. The amount of calls that we do on a nightly basis and the amount of places that we go, there's still a lot of facilities out there that we have yet to be in. So this right here allows us that opportunity to get into it before it even opens. That way, in the event that something like that does happen, these officers that are going to be responding or the officers that are actually partaking in this exercise today are going to have that firsthand knowledge. And police add each training drill is different. So in a hospital setting like this one, officers also have to take into account more people and possibly more victims inside than at a smaller business. Hello again, everyone. I'm Ariel Hawani in Las Vegas here to cover UFC 216. But this afternoon, we have the absolute pleasure of speaking to Dr. Jeffrey Davidson. If you're a longtime UFC fan, there's a very good chance you have seen this man at a UFC event or two. If not, at the very least, you've heard his name. He's referenced all the time by the likes of UFC President Dana White and other UFC officials. This afternoon, though, we're talking to him about the events that took place uh, late Sunday here in Las Vegas. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Davidson is not only the chief medical physician for the UFC, he's had that position for over a decade, but for the last 20 plus years, he's been a practicing doctor here in Las Vegas, Nevada at the uh, Valley Hospital here. He's the chief medical doctor in the emergency department. Did I get that right, Mr. Davidson? You did. You okay. did. Thank you. It's a lot to digest, and I really appreciate your time uh, here today. It has been, uh, I mean, a trying uh, 72 or so hours in this community, and you have been at the forefront of it all. So let's start at the beginning. Let's start Sunday evening. Where were you at around 10 p.m. Pacific time when you got the call that this was going on just on the Las Vegas Strip a couple miles from here? Uh, Sunday evening, I was at home, <clears throat> probably like everyone else, getting ready to kind of get ready for nighttime Sunday night. Uh, I was notified by one of my office directors that there was a shooting, possibly a mass shooting with multiple victims, and that we were going to initiate what's called a mass casualty incident or a disaster drill. Um, initially didn't know what she was talking about, as many people didn't. She said, turn on your TV. Uh, at that time, I did. I started to witness what everyone else in the world was witnessing. Uh, quickly got into, I call it doctor mode, and, and, and uh, headed down to the emergency department. Um, was there very quickly, and uh, when I walked in, it was a pretty horrific sight. Uh, multiple victims had been brought in both by uh, the EMS system, which is the ambulance system, and also by private vehicle. People were just being brought in by anyone and anyone that could pick someone up and bring them into the area hospitals. Um, at that time, my understanding was the uh, multiple trauma emergency departments that we have in the community uh, were at capacity and that the patients were also being dispersed to all the other area emergency departments. And uh, we're in proximity to one of the trauma centers, and so we were catching multiple patients coming over to our facility at that time. And for those that don't know, how far away is the Valley Hospital from the Mandalay Bay? The it's really down the freeway. It's about a 10 to 15 minute uh, distance uh, by ambulance or private vehicle drive, so it's fairly close. And so you get there at around 11 or so, 11.30, and there's already a horrific scene. As you said, there's already a ton of people injured who have already arrived from the shooting. As I walked in, like you said, uh, multiple victims um, kind of throughout the hallways, uh, in gurneys, uh, everywhere. Um, I was very proud that uh, multiple physicians had already been coordinated in addition to me to get there. I had 
uh, multiple ED physicians with me. I had my ED nursing staff, which had uh, doubled in its capacity, multiple ED ancillary help, support techs, uh, phlebotomists, all the people you would need to really handle that type of mass casualty incident. Um, at the same time, I was able to get in touch with general surgeons, uh, specialists like ear, nose, and throat specialists, vascular surgeons, cardiovascular surgeons, and they all, uh, without even thinking, came right into the emergency department to help us with all the specific injuries we were seeing. Considering the fact that you work in the emergency department, you are used to high pressure situations, but when you walk into a scene like that, how do you start? Where do you begin? What do you do? What's the first step? Uh, for me that evening, it was, uh, as I was taking kind of scene command of the emergency department, I had all the emergency department physicians who had already begun to triage and see what we call the appropriate order from the most severely injured to we, would, we thought the least injured. Um, and as they were seeing those patients and beginning the resuscita resuscitation measures such as IV fluids, hanging blood products, stabilizing hemorrhaging wounds, um, I would get the uh, report from them and then I would decide who would be able to go to the operating rooms first based on the criticality of their injuries. Um, so you begin with the beginning and you just start with the what's thought to be the most severely injured that needed the operating rooms the quickest and you just keep working down and you keep repeating back and as patients conditions changed uh, things had to be changed and sometimes patients had to be moved into the operating rooms quickly and sometimes we were able to continue resuscitation efforts in the emergency department. Obviously this was the deadliest mass shooting in American history. Have you ever even remotely been in a situation like this where it's just a constant stream of people that you have to work on? No. I mean, uh, 20 years plus of active uh, you know, emergency department work here. Uh, I trained Phoenix, Arizona, very busy uh, emergency department training with a large uh, population in Phoenix. Um, I think you always prepare when you're an emergency department physician. This is, a lot of us call it doctor mode, and we, we prepare for a disaster, and we actually do several disaster drills but I don't think anything prepares you uh, for an event that occurred like occurred this last Sunday. In the span of 24 or so hours, how many people do you think that you, you treated? Uh, I think some of the numbers have been coming back to me. Um, you know, it always seems more at the time. I think the other thing to remember for the, for the, the public is at the time this event occurred, uh, all the emergency departments in the air were already already actively taking care of their emergencies that had already arrived. So, for example, the emergency departments were fairly full with emergency department patients. So when this uh, next uh, infusion of a large number of victims came in, it really took capacities to a new level. Um, I think uh, from what I've been told at our facility, uh, we did multiple operations. Uh, we did uh, you know, gunshot wounds to the chest, the abdomen, the extremities, uh, to the face. Um, we uh, had over 30 patients at our facility and multiple other Valley Health System hospitals did the same. Um, I know the Sunrise System uh, was exceptional in their trauma response and had over 200 patients at that facility. So I think collectively the community came together and I think every hospital uh, by doing something collectively uh, helped the entire community. You're a great doctor, you're also a human being, your father, you have two boys, right? Um, yeah. And, you know, you're seeing this unfold and I'm sure as time goes by, people are trickling in and it's very emotional and people are looking for loved ones. How are you able to separate the human and the emotions that you're feeling? This is your town, right? You're, you're very close to this uh, community and trying to focus on the task at hand. Uh, I've been in Vegas a long time. I love Las Vegas. I think there's, it's a great city. It has a lot of opportunity for, for community, for, for family. Um, you know, it was very hard. I think the hardest part was what you touched on, Ariel, that um, I have two, two, ch two young uh, teenage boys, and uh, I kept thinking, you know, they're out at these types of events. And uh, so I, my heart not only went out to the victims, but it went out to the families. There were a lot of very distraught uh, family members and friends walking around just trying to get a little bit of information and it was slow to them uh, because the process was to care for the patient and then try and communicate as fast as we could but it was difficult my heart really went out to all the not just the victims but the families of the victims the friends of the victims and i think the hardest thing was to continue the communication to them uh, even the following day and the following day how long did you work? So this is, a, you know, 11, midnight, 1. How long did you work 
before you were, you know, released from from your shift, if you want to call it a shift. I mean, it's a pretty long one, I would imagine. It, it was a, it was a very long night, and obviously through the morning hours, I uh, got to the hospital about 11 p.m. that night and stayed till four o'clock the next day. Wow. Uh, went home and came back at 6 a.m. the next morning, wow. and then worked another uh, nine, ten hours. Um, I don't know if it's how long you worked, but I think it was. Uh, that, that evening and that morning it was more the adrenaline and the mode of doing all you can. And again, boy, I just want to emphasize, it wasn't just doctor or doctors, it was everyone. Um, the, the nurses that I worked with, I couldn't be more proud of. The technicians, um, the staff, everyone. And, um, you know, also just you have to be looking at those patients and realizing as many patients as there were and as injured as they were and as afraid as they were, they all kept very calm. Mm -hmm. it, it was an amazing thing to witness that the actual victims were so calm and I think that's a tribute to the, the community and the hospitals that they were confident and they were they knew they were in good care and I think that's a tribute to the staff providing that sense of confidence to them. How extensive were some of these surgeries that you performed? I mean is this of the of the highest order? Is this you know I mean you're talking about gunshot wounds to the to the face right? This is pretty extensive stuff? It was very extensive. Uh, you know, I trained in an uh, emergency department that had uh, trauma and burn centers, and so I've been exposed to much in my career and my training. Um, I think some of the injuries we saw Sunday night, and I'm sure all the ED physicians in the community saw, uh, were as severe as we all see. Uh, this was a very high caliber, uh, you know, gun used, uh, bullets were uh, everywhere, and victims came in with injuries everywhere. I mean, literally face, chest, abdomen, torso extremities um so it was it was, it was horrific uh and uh i think the only uh console that i have is that there were so many great physicians that responded and uh um, you know at every facility we have different levels of success based on the injuries but i think uh, as i've begun to get information back from many different sources that there has been uh, improvement with many patients do you have any idea how many patients came to the hospital in that, you know, 24-hour stretch? Would you have any idea? You know, right now I don't have that number, but uh, what's uh, another number to uh, know is it's not just the gunshot uh, wounds that we also cared for. There were many patients that had trampling injuries. You know, when you had 20,000-plus uh, in individuals enjoying that concert, um, and as you watch the videos that you've all seen this week, you can see they all exited very quickly. And in that, some people were, you know, accidentally stepped on or fell to the ground or whatnot. So there were also other injuries that were secondary injuries to just the crowd exiting so quickly. Do you have any idea how many have been released since Monday? Um, I was just in the uh, intensive care unit this morning, and all of our intensive care unit patients are doing, uh, they're stable. Okay. Um, uh, that's as much as I'd like to comment on that. Okay. Uh, and then uh, many patients have been released from the hospital that were not in the intensive care unit. Um, it is Thursday, so we're four days removed, a little less than four days. What is the vibe like in the hospital now? Does it still feel like a high intense situation or is it easing a little bit? You know, you touched on a, a, a thought that, that's going to take a long time to understand. You know, um, the emotional aspect of this is what's going to probably start to kick in about today like okay. you said um, how every individual victim victim's family and all of the providers begin to deal with the the mental aspect of this is going to be everyone's uh, case by case um, i imagine there'll be a lot of people that will have to uh, deal with uh, what happened in different ways uh, there's all types of different support structure out there now that is been provided to the community by different organizations and different uh, people, um, but it's going to be difficult. I think uh, the memory of what occurred will take some time for everyone to um, understand and, and try and deal with, uh, and I, I think that's going to be the difficult issue now is how to mentally have everyone uh, try and move forward the best they can. Have you had a chance to digest it all, to have a moment you know, to yourself and, and, and to allow this to sink in? You know, I've had a few moments. Um, I think the week has been uh, so time consuming that I really haven't just sat by myself and thought what we did as a group, what the community did. Um, I think, you know, in the future that I'll have that moment and uh, it'll, it'll be a difficult moment to deal with, I think, at that time.
Uh, one thing that I read, um, and I don't know if, if this affects you in your position, but a lot of the um, a lot of the victims did not have IDs, maybe didn't have their. Did that make things difficult for the group, um, especially when people are trying to find, you know, a loved one? I, I think you kind of uh, answered the question perfectly. You know, caring for the patients was straightforward. Everyone okay. got a specific kind of what's called the triage number and we cared immediately for all the patients. And when you get that big of an influx of patients at all the facilities, that's that's the system you put in place. Um, but I think to your question, it must have been incredibly stressful for families and loved ones to say, which hospital did my loved one go to? Where are they? Are they okay? How do I even find them? Um, when you listen to the victim's stories this week, Everyone lost their phones, they lost their ID, right. they lost their wallet. So, you know, and many of these people, as you've already accounted, um, weren't transported by ambulance. They were transported by just private vehicle. So I don't even know if many people even knew where they were going and, or who was taking them right. to the area hospital they ended up at. Uh, we don't live here, got here yesterday to cover UFC 216, and uh, I noted yesterday that there's a, a somber feeling. I mean, this is usually a very festive town, especially when we're here for a UFC event. Right. Uh, this is a place where people go to forget their troubles, but it's a, it's a different vibe, and understandably so. As someone who lives here, how would you describe what it's like just, you know, we're on the strip, you're in the community, so you have that contact with families and your neighbors. What's it been like for you? I think, yeah, uh, I think you were accurate. It's very, uh, it's quiet. It's, uh, it's a calm, um, it's people trying to understand uh, the horrific senseless acts that just occurred. Um, I think it will take some time for the community. I, I hope the community uh, continues to move forward, but I think it will take time for all the, the community to adjust to what just happened. Uh, and like I said, to deal with it. Um, I think it's something we will understand as a, as, a hum, as a human race and we'll move forward and we'll become stronger and better as, as we all hope. Uh, but you're right, it's a little bit of a less vibrant uh, time period right now for us. Long before the Raiders and the Golden Knights, the UFC was the hometown team here. Dana White is a very proud resident of Las Vegas and he's sort of a defiant character as well and so I had no doubt that he would proceed with the show and show everyone that you know Vegas is very strong. Um, he also announced that they'd be donating a million dollars to um, the patients and the victims and so I'm just wondering as someone who's been affiliated with the UFC for over a decade you worked for the Nevada Athletic Commission, ringside physician, worked in boxing I mean, you're very entrenched in the combat sports world here. Your reaction when you when you heard what Dana White said and the donation as well? Um, you know I expected nothing less. I, I knew Dana White uh, he is all heart uh, I knew that, that both himself, his family, and then his UFC family, I, I knew they would come to the assistance of the community. That he's always done that. Uh, the UFC has always done that. Uh, they, they donate in so many different ways. It's not, just, it's not just monetary, it's time, it's the actual athletes. Um, it, th there's a lot of different ways, but uh, Dana has always uh, given out to this community. He's probably poured as much into this community uh, as anyone I can think of. So uh, I would expect nothing less. I, would, I always know that uh, if something happens in this community that adversely affects it, you can count on Dana White, you can count on UFC. They're going to be there to support the community always. Will you be working the event on Saturday? I will be there. Wow. I will be there. I think that's, I, I think, as you said, the right thing to do is uh, continue to move forward. Um, at the same time, we don't want to forget what happened. We don't want to forget the patients we're taking care of. Uh, but I think the right thing to do is trying to continue to move forward. And do you, like, if it just in a situation like this, do you at some point take a break? Like, you, you're not a robot, right? You're going to have a moment where this is going to really hit you. How do you, how do you deal with that? Because you have to be, you know, at 100%. You're doing a very important job. How do you plan that out? Well, I haven't planned that out. Okay. Uh, I, I think... Not the uh, time. Yeah, I think, the, I think the, the, the right thing for me to do right now is just continue to... Uh, I have responsibilities uh, to the hospital, uh, to the emergency medical system here in the community, and I have responsibilities to the UFC, and I think the right thing to do is uh, continue to be, uh, you know, to, to work for all the, the organizations I, I, I work for. I, I enjoy them, and I think the responsibility is to continue to work for them. Um, when I do get a moment uh, in a week, it'll be a quiet moment where I think back on what we uh, just came through. Final thing, is there anything that the people out there can do? Um, I, I know that a lot of um, you know, civilians came and donated blood. Um, just wondering if there's anything at this point from your vantage point that you've seen that anyone at home who wants to help is able to do. Um, you know, listen, I, I would compliment the entire community and everyone. Um, you touched on it, but uh, the outpouring at the Red Cross blood bank donations was amazing. The outpouring of community businesses and uh, residential that came to 
all of the hospitals with donations of food and water and supplies for not just the medical group, but for families. Um, the outpouring from the area hotels that provided rooms and, and, and things has been amazing. I think as, as, as a community, everyone has continued to do a, a tremendous amount. And I think uh, all we can all try and do is kind of learn from this and move forward and do the right thing so that hopefully nothing like this ever happens again. Thank you very much, Doctor. I really appreciate this. I know you're so busy, so for you to come out and talk to us, I uh, really appreciate it, and thank you for everything that you've done for the community over the past few days. Honored to talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you very much.